لما يا مخلوق آثرت الجحود كنت معدوما فمن أين الوجود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود قبله في الكون من بعده السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May the peace, the blessings, and the mercy of Allah be with each and every one of you. Welcome again to another one of our classes and daros on the tafsir of the Holy Quran. And we are discussing the verses of Surah Dukhan, and we had completed until verse 37 so far. The topic of discussion that went on uh, in verse 36 together with verse um, 37 and the before that 34 and 35 was where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was mentioning to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that these people around you, the Quraysh people who did not believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and did not accept the belief of uh, in the oneness of Allah, uh, the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that they, these people, the Quraysh, they are saying to you, there is nothing but our first death and we shall not be resurrected. So they deny the resurrection, they deny the judgment, they deny the concept of life after death and they were saying that we don't believe in this resurrection and we don't believe in the day of judgment and we will live after we die. But just this is the first death and that's it. And then they challenged the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, just as they challenged other prophets in the past, yani the, the people, the nations of those prophets. And they said, then bring back our forefathers if you speak the truth. So, so actually they were saying to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if what you are saying is the truth, bring back our forefathers. And when you bring back our forefathers, we will ask them whether there is life after death. And if they say there is, then we will believe. And if they say there is no life after that, then we would not believe in you. So obviously, this was just, uh, you know, a way of, uh, you know, being uh, foolish in other words, that nobody will ask a question like that to bring back the people of the past who died 50 and 60, 70, 100 years ago. But they just wanted to, to, to make it difficult for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in response to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are they better or the people of Tubba? These people who are around you and they are making such requests to you, are they better or the people of Tubba and those before them? Obviously, these people around you cannot be better than those people of the past. You know, those people were mighty, they were wealthy, they were strong, they were powerful, they ruled, they had great authority. They had empires and palaces. They had names to go with them, big names and famous names. But where are those people now? They were destroyed by Allah. When they disbelieved in their prophets, they were destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look what happened to Fir'aun. Look what happened to the people of Ad and Thamud. Look what happened to the people of uh, Lut alayhi salam, the five cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Look what happened to the people at the time of Nuh alayhi salam. Look at what happened to the people at the time of Isa alayhi salam. And all these different, uh, let's say, these nations were before them. So Allah says, these people who are around you, O Prophet, O Muhammad, are they better, or are they better than those who went before them? And the Quraysh themselves will say, no, they are not better than those people that, that, that went before them <coughs> or who went before them. So the, <coughs> so the teaching <coughs> Allah says to them that those people who were far better than you, they were destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> they were destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you behave in this manner, where you are actually challenge, challenging Allah and challenging the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, then that will be your fate also. You will be destroyed. So while discussing this ayat, <coughs> the name Tubba came about. And they better the people of Tubba. And the, in our last discussion, we were speaking about Tubba. And according to many different ahadiths, that are mentioned by different compilers of ahadith coming from different sahabas radiallahu ta'ala anhum. It is mentioned that Tubba was a Yemeni king or Hemyari king from Hemyar, Yemen. And he was a righteous king. He was a just king. You know, as it is mentioned, Hafiz ibn Kathir, 
himself narrated that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha used to say, do not speak ill of Tubba, for he was a righteous man. And it is stated that Tubba ruled as a king for 326 years, the longest period a king of Hemyar or Yemen ever ruled for. And he died 700 years before the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this in a nutshell was who Tubba was. So it went on further to say that when uh, Tubba passed through Medina, which was then Yathrib, and uh, he wanted to fight against the people, that he, some things happened that, that he could not actually continue to fight them. And then he was told that you cannot dominate this land. You cannot conquer this land because this land is the land to which the last of all the prophets will migrate to. So you cannot. This land belongs to somebody else. So this is why. And the king Tubba saw that. And when he learned that a prophet would come to that land, he actually wrote letters and wrote poetic stanzas showing his faith in the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, we were discussing the letter that he wrote. And he left it to those people who were alive at his time. And he left the wasiyat. Wasiyat means that he left uh, the advice that they must continue to pass this letter down in generations until that Prophet Muhammad upon whom a peace comes and he must receive this letter. And it is also mentioned in different traditions that he actually built a house for that Prophet who will migrate to Medina. And we are speaking about 700 years before the Prophet وسلم, actually came on the face of the earth to the people in Makkah and then to Medina. And then by extension, the entire world, he came to the entire world. So 700 years before, when Tubba learned, and who, from whom he learned this? From the Jewish scholars. Because the Jewish scholars knew from the prophecy of Musa salam, that the final prophet will, would come in that land. He would come. They believed that. And this is why they told uh, Tubba that this is the land the last prophet will migrate to, which is, uh, was the land known as Yathrib. And then it became after the Prophet wasalam, came to that land, which was known as Yathrib, it became known as Medina to Nabi. Medina to Nabi means the city of the Prophet. Medina in Arabic means a city. So Medina to Nabi means the city of the Prophet. And then it started to be used as a proper name, Medina, Medina. But the word Medina can be used for any city. This is why, this is why it used to be called Medina to Nabi, the city of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So anyhow, when he learned that the Prophet will be, that last Prophet will be coming to this land, and he will migrate to this land. He actually built a house and he allowed people to stay there and left the letter in that house with the people who were living in that. And when they, that is when they reach old age, they're about to die, leave it to their children, the letter. And then those people, when they become old and if the prophet does not come in their lifetime, leave it with their children until it passed through generations from one hand to the other hand until, until, it remained and came in the hand of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala was that companion who was living in that very house which Tubba had built 700 years ago. Living in that house when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina. Now when he came to Medina and he migrated, everybody wanted to be the host of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So everybody was trying to hold the reins of the camel to carry the camel because he was seated on the camel, to carry the camel to his house. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be his guest. But then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, Da'aha fa innaha ma'mura, leave, leave the camel alone. Don't hold the reins or the rope, leave it. Let it go on its own, for this camel has been ordered already by Allah where it should stop or where she should stop. And the camel went and eventually it stopped right without anybody indicating to, to the camel, anybody beckoning the camel and bringing it closer to a certain house, a certain building. The camel went and sat directly in the yard of the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala 
and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came out there and he resided there until he actually has had his own place there in the rooms that were uh, attached and uh, built close to the, what, uh, the Masjid al-Nabawi. So the, he got the letter, subhanallah. So therefore, in the letter which actually Abu Hayyan, the great commentator, the author of Bahr al-Muhid, the famous commentary of the Holy Quran, the contents of the letter read that Tubba is saying this to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He wrote it in a letter. We had already discussed the, the poetic stanzas that were mentioned before. So he said in this letter, Tubba is saying this is a king that lived 700 years before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, as for after praising Allah, I believe in you. He's saying this, I believe in you and in the book which has been sent to you. Subhanallah. And then he says, I am upon your religion and your sunnah. I am upon your religion, your Islam, and your path, your sunnah. I believe in your Lord and the Lord of everything. And I believe in all that has come to you from your Lord of the Sharia of Islam. If I am able to meet you, then it will be good, subhanallah. If I am able to meet you, then it will be good. But if I do not meet you, subhanallah, then I ask you to intercede for me and do not forget me on the day of judgment, subhanAllah, for I am the first of your followers and have followed you before your prophethood. What a beautiful statement. He's saying, Tubba is saying, if I do not, if I meet you, it is good. But if I do not meet you and I die before you actually come, then I ask you to intercede for me. That is on the day of judgment. He's asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to intercede for him. And do not forget me on the day of judgment. Why? Because I am the first of your followers. I have not seen you as yet, but I have heard about you. And by hearing about you, such belief has, has entered in my heart that I already believe in you. So I am the first of your followers and have followed you before your prophethood. Verily, Tubba writes, I am upon your religion and the religion of your father Ibrahim alayhi salam, which is the same religion. He Tubba then sealed the letter with the inscription. He sealed the letter and inscribed where he sealed it. He says, to Allah belong all matters that are before and after and addressed it with the words. This is, he addressed it to Muhammad bin Abdullah, the prophet of Allah and his messenger the seal of all prophets and the messenger of the Lord of the worlds from Tubba the first because he was the first king. Subhanallah, this was the, the letter that he wrote and, and actually it was left uh, and passed in from hand, one hand to the other hand. Subhanallah, it is stated that the letter along with the poetic verses of King Tubba came down in the hands of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala whose proper name is Khalid bin Zaid radiallahu ta'ala who delivered it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From the time of King Tubba, the letter passed through many hands from one generation to the other until it was delivered to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as it is mentioned in Tafsir Al-Bahr Al-Muhit. Subhanallah, what a beautiful letter by Tubba. So this is about Tubba, Tubba that is mentioned in the Holy Quran approximately in two places that it has been mentioned. Now Tubba was a righteous king. And uh, he had a nation because there were people who followed him on the, in his kingdom. He was a believer and the people continued to believe in him. But after he left, the people reverted and went back to idolatry and went back to disbelief. This is why when Allah mentions about a punishment, he mentioned the punishment about Qawmu Tubba, the people of Tubba and not Tubba himself because Tubba was not from amongst them. So as it is mentioned here, the commentators have also mentioned that although the people of Tubba accepted the religion of the oneness of Allah at the time of King Tubba, they returned to disbelief after he passed away. At that time, they began to worship idols and fire and turned against the true religion of Allah. On account of this, Allah's punishment fell upon them and they were all destroyed. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the eye of the Holy Quran, Are they better or the people of Tubba? And those before them, we destroyed them. Who were destroyed? The people of Tubba, but Tub, not Tubba. Tubba was a righteous man who was a believer. 
So it continues now in verse 38. That Surah al dukhan goes further in verse 38 and states, And we created not the heavens and the earth, and all that is between them for mere play. Subhanallah. What is Allah saying? Allah says, And we created not the heavens and the earth. And when the word we is used, it refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And in Arabic language, this is known as the plural of respect. Not the plural of numbers, but the plural of respect. So that although the word we is used, it refers to Allah himself. That Allah created the heavens and the earth. But Allah is saying in this ayah, He did not create the heavens and the earth. And everything between the heavens and the earth, and whatever we have around us, and the, all the planets and, and the oceans and the mountains, and whatever you can think about and you know of uh, that is present on the earth, and between the heavens and the earth, every single thing Allah has created. But he said, we did not create it for a mere play. We did not create it for entertainment. We did not create it for amusement. In this world, human beings make something and it's just, uh, it is just meant to be for play and amusement. Sometimes people make something or they do something and you ask them, what did you build? They said, nothing, it's just for play. It's just for passing time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above that. Whatever Allah does, it is, it is with great hikmah. And it is with great wisdom that Allah does something. So definitely, the massive structure of the heavens and the skies, and this massive and spacious earth that Allah has created, that stretches far and wide, it just could not be without a purpose. There was a, an objective in the creation of every single thing. There yeah, certainly is an objective for the creation of human beings. We were not just created just, just like that for, for, for no purpose at all. There is a reason for living. There is an objective in life itself. And this is why Allah has sent prophets to people to explain to them what is the objective of life. Why are you alive? Let's look at it. We came from nothing. We were nothing before and Allah created us. And now we are on the face of the earth. And we will die and we will return to Allah. So if we were, were, were actually not here and we came here and then we will leave here again, the question is, what is really the purpose of here? <laughs> um, think about it. We were not here, human beings. We were not here. I was not here. You were not here. Nobody knew about you. Nobody knew about anybody else. And then we came on the face of the earth. And then we will live for some years and then we will move on. We will die. We will be buried. And we will go and enter into the realm of another life. So if we were once upon a time not here, and then in a few years' time we will again be not here, what really is the purpose of us being here now? Subhanallah. Well, that's the question. Why are we here? What are we doing here? What is the purpose of, of living in the world? There is a higher objective for the creation of man. And this is where Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created a man and jinn except that they should serve me, except that they should do servitude, except that they should worship me, except that they should be obedient to me and listen to me and humble themselves as mine slaves. And that is the real objective. So this is why before now, Allah sent us, we're in the world of souls, and then when we die, the first question we will be asking the grave is, Man Rabbuka, who is your Lord? Why? Because the purpose of life was to serve our Lord. So when we die, the first question we will actually answer in the grave is, Man Rabbuka, who is your Lord? Did you live a life and for you forgot about your Lord? Well, if you forgot about your Lord in this world, you will forget about him in the grave. But if you remember your Lord in this world, you will remember him in the grave. So Allah is saying in this ayah, this, this big structure, the structure of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them, we did not create it, Allah says, for a mere play and amusement. So as it is mentioned in the Shara and the commentary, here Allah notifies man of the truth of resurrection. And that he is the creator of everything. That he created the heavens and earth and everything. And after creating everything, he says that he did not create the heavens and the earth. And whatever is between them in vain, he did not create it for that purpose. 
He did not create these massive creations in vain without a purpose or for the sake of amusement or play. Instead, he created these with an objective and a firm purpose, subhanallah. He created it for a purpose. As I said, people in this world will do many things to last for a few years. And then it disappears, it vanishes, it's destroyed. It's for muse amusement, <coughs> for play, to, for entertainment, and that's human beings. Human beings will do many things, and if you ask a person, why did you do that? He says, I don't know. You know, why did you build that? I don't know. It's just there. Allah doesn't do that. Man will do that because man does not sometimes understand the purpose of his existence. But Allah is Al-Hakim. Allah is Al-Hakim. The Holy Quran says it again and again. What is Al-Hakim? Who is Al-Hakim? Al-Hakim means the most wise. And the one who is the most wise does not do a single thing except it is filled with hikmah and wisdom. <clears throat> Every single thing that Allah has created in the heavens and the earth and between. And whatever Allah has created for us and in us, there is a wisdom. Every single thing in the universe and world of Allah, it serves a purpose. purpose. <clears throat> From the hugest creator, the biggest crea crea uh, creation and creature to the tiniest insect on the face of the earth. Every single thing, it serves a purpose, which is known to Allah alone. It may not be, you know, we may not understand it. We may not be able to understand why this is so and why this is so and why that has been created like that and why that has been created. But there is definitely hikmah and wisdom and there is a purpose in the creation of every single thing. So Allah goes further and He says, We created them not except with truth. <coughs> Heavens, we created with truth, in the truth, for the truth. We created the earth and everything between the heavens and the earth. We created it for not for anything except with the truth, but most of them know not. And yani most of the creation, <coughs> most of the people do not understand the purpose of the creation. Allah says we created it in truth for a purpose. For a definite purpose, we created it to establish the truth of the existence of Allah. We created, to, we created it to show <coughs> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is real. He is the all-powerful because everything that is around us, from the skies above our heads to the layers of the earth beneath our feet, and that which surround us from the animal kingdom and the vegetation kingdom and every single thing you can think about, they are all manifestations of the great power and the qudrat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unique creator, the all-powerful, al-qadir subhanallah. So here Allah says that he created the heavens, the earth, and all that which is between them in truth. That is, he created these to establish the truth. And to make it, that is to make the truth manifest so that man may recognize the truth and believe in the oneness of Allah and be obedient to Him. So Allah has created the mountains. When a man looks at the mountain, what will he think? He will say, Subhanallah, no human being could have created those humongous mountains standing like pegs. So large, so great, so big, so huge. So looking so powerful, anyone who looks above his head and he sees the sky will realize <coughs> that no man can actually create that and those things cannot come on its own. <coughs> when he looks around him and every type of creature he sees and everything he sees, he will realize that there is a creator. There is someone who created. So then when he understands that there is someone who created it, he will begin to do what? Believe in that one who created the human being, himself, the man, and everything. And when he believes in that creator, he will begin to serve that creator. This is really the purpose of the creation of everything, so that man may understand that he has a creator and serve the creator. Upon this, that is, when people begin to recognize that there is a creator and serve their creator, Upon this, the doers of good 
shall be compensated for their good in the hereafter. In other words, those who recognize their creator and worship him and obey him for their good deeds in this world, they shall be given a return, a handsome return in the hereafter. And the doers of evil shall suffer the consequences of their evil. However, many people are not aware of this and so they disbelieve in the resurrection and judgment. So when we understand that there is a creator who has created us and everything, we will begin to believe in that creator. And when we begin to believe in that creator, we will serve that creator and we will do good deeds and we will be obedient and not do bad things. Therefore, when this world comes to an end, it will be the time for retribution and compensation. That at that time now, in this world, you cannot get justice, subhanAllah. You may, you may not. You know, you, people take advantage of you, people oppress you, and no matter what you try, you just can't, justice cannot be served then. You live in, in oppression, you live in, in actually being oppressed for the rest of your life as Muslim, and, and that is how it might be until you die. When will you really see justice in the world hereafter, in the next life? When Allah will be the judge and every single person who had done some good will get the return and the exchange and the compensation for his good. And so too, everyone who did a wrong, who was unjust to another one, who oppressed the other one, who took advantage, who stole from another one, who robbed another one, who cheated from another, who cheated another person, every wrong, he shall actually suffer the consequences for that. So this life is lived and, you know, your, 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 the reward for your goodness may not be given. You may not see it. For your whole life, you may be doing good to other people and you will not even get a thank you. Subhanallah. <coughs> or Jazakallah. But when you die in that life hereafter, this is why that day is called the day of reckoning and accounting. That will be the day of justice also. Where everyone will be served justice. And so, those who have done good in this world, they will be repaid with good goodness in the hereafter. And those who did evil and bad and were wicked to others in this world, they shall suffer the consequences for their evil. This is the truth what Allah wants to show. But Allah says, many people do not know that. So they do not know uh, that you do good here, you will get good there. And you do bad here, you will get bad there. And because of the fact that they do not know it, or they do not want to know it, or they hear about it and turn away from it, they live their lives like animals. They do wrong, they are wicked, they oppress people. They do all sorts of wrong things they want to do. And they live on, and they live on, and they live on until they die. And then, when they die, the eyes are open to the reality of the next life, but it's too late. So both the above verses make it evident that Allah has created the heavens and the earth and all that is between them for a specific purpose. There is a purpose for life. There is a purpose in the creation. These were not created in vain or for play and amusement. Instead, there was a higher objective in the creation of everything. From the time Allah created it, there was a higher objective. There was a reason. <clears throat> While commenting on this, the commentators of the Holy Quran have stated, Verily, Allah has created human beings and have created all such things <coughs> which are means for his livelihood and living on the earth. <coughs> they have stated, Verily, Allah has created human beings. So we have been created by Allah. And Allah has created all such things which are means for his livelihood and living on the face of the earth. <clears throat> so since Allah has created us, whatever we need for our survival, <coughs> for our eats and our drinks, Allah has created all those things. And whatever we need for our comfort to live and carry on with this life, a place to live, a place to sleep, a place to rest, Allah has also created that. So Allah has created in this world, after creating us, Allah has created a means for our livelihood 
and also Allah has created a place for our survival. He has placed above them a raised ceiling, which is the sky, which protects us. And he has made the earth spread out for him, that is for man, to live comfortable on. We live, subhanAllah, many different types of land on the face of the earth. There are those where we cannot live, those portions of land we cannot live on, and there are those places that we can live on. Between the heavens and the earth, Allah has made wonderful and amazing creations which are all beneficial and useful to human beings, subhanAllah. Having done these for man, Allah has instructed him <coughs> to believe in him and be obedient to him. But while some complied with this command and believed in Allah, others disobeyed and disbelieved in him. Therefore, in order to serve justice to man and repay him for what he has done, Allah has made the day of judgment so that those who have done good may receive the rewards for good and those who have done bad may suffer the consequences of their bad. If there was no resurrection and judgment, then the creation of this world and the creation of man would have been in vain and without a purpose. If there was no day that will come where justice will be served, when everybody will get what he had worked for, then all that we are doing here, actually it will be useless. You know, all the worship that we are doing and all the good things we are doing, because in this world, we will see it <coughs> with our own eyes that a man may live his entire life and fill his entire life with goodness. And he may, as I said, he may not get any sort of appreciation from anybody. Subhanallah. <clears throat> and we have that. So Allah has made the day of judgment to judge the deeds of man. This is why it is called the day of judgment. He will judge the actions of people. And people will be compensated for what they have done. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made everything to work in harmony. So that when we leave this world, then after that, this world also will be destroyed. This world will not remain forever. This world will be destroyed. The sun, the, the, the moon, the skies, everything will crumble to pieces. Subhanallah. And Allah has spoken about that. And there will be a new world. The world of the hereafter. Yawmul Akhara, The last day, the, the hereafter. The world of the hereafter. Where every good that you have done, you will see it. And every bad you have done, you will see it also. Except that Allah has mercy and Allah forgives the evil and the bad of people. Surah Dukhan goes further in verse 40 and states, Verily, the day of decision is the time appointed for all of them. Yawm al-Fasli. Verily, the day of decision is the time appointed for all of them. That Allah says that let people live. Sometimes people do not want to believe. But the day when Allah will make that decision that has already been appointed for them. Nobody can escape that. Nobody can escape. No matter what you do, you can't escape that. We can't escape going into the life of the hereafter. That is there. And that day when Allah will make a decision about every single person, that day is fixed already and it will come to pass. So in the verse, the day of decision is the day of judgment since Allah will decide the matters of all servants and creations on that day. So since he will decide the case of people, it is called the day of decision where he will decide. The verse explains that the day of judgment is the day which Allah has appointed for the reckoning and accounting of all his creations. Each will give an account of his deeds and a decision will be made by Allah regarding him. So every day, a day will come when every single thing a man did on the face of the earth, he will be questioned about it and he will see it and he will have to account for the deeds that he had done. As for the good deeds, he will get rewards for that. So that will be in his favor. But as for those wrong things he did and the wrong things he said, and all the different thoughts that actually he brought in his heart. And then he actually entertained those thoughts and were firm with those thoughts in his heart. Harboring ill feelings and malice and hatred against others. 
all those things he will account to Allah for and Allah will decide his case. So we live in this world and there seems to be nobody above us who is deciding our case. <coughs> Human beings live with a type of liberty where he feels that nobody can do him anything. And he feels that nobody has an authority over him. So you often hear people saying, I could do what I want to do. <coughs> I could say what I want to say. Nobody is controlling my life and nobody can't control my life. This is the tendency of people. This is why we see people do weird things. They do strange things. Things that you will not even bring in your mind that a human being can do. People do that. Why? Because that is the feeling within a human being. There is nobody above me. There is no authority over me. Nobody can tell me what to do. Nobody can uh, make a decision for me. I make my own decision. This is only limited to this small little place that is called the earth. But as soon as that takes place, a man will realize how incapable and how dependent he is on upon the power of another one. So on that day, subhanallah, Allah will make the decision for him. That all the while, on the face of the man, the man was thinking, I'm free, I have full liberty. I can do, I can say, I can... Whatever I want to do, I'll do it. You know, nobody can make a decision for me and say, do this and don't do that and do that. He, all he has to do is wait a little bit. What is the ayah saying? Verily, the day of decision is a time appointed for them. Allah says, nobody can escape that day. Allah has already fixed that day. So it's an appointment that Allah has made with us already. That is what the ayah is saying. Nobody can miss that. That day will come. And Allah will make that decision and man will realize that there is someone above him and he really is not a person who has full liberty and freedom to do whatever he wants to because there will be a power over him to make a decision for him. About that day Allah says in verse 41 telling us about that day what will be the situation on that day will people so, with people he already told us that day where he will make a decision is a day that is appointed already. He has fixed that day. What will happen on that day? Verse 41 says, The day when a near relative cannot avail a near relative in aught. That is in anything. And no help can they receive. Subhanallah. Allah is saying the day when a near relative cannot avail a near relative in aught. It means on that day of judgment, no close family will be able to help another close family member in anything, subhanAllah. In this world, <coughs> if you are in trouble, if you are in difficulties, if you are going through hard times and sufferings, even if somebody wants to take advantage on you, you can call a family member. You may even get help from a friend or even a stranger in this world. But Allah says on that day, when He will make the decision for everybody, your closest family member will not be able to help you. You will see that person. You will see that person. You will know that person. You will scream out for help. But Allah says no. No help can one give to another one. Even your closest family member, you will not be able to help him in the least. And they cannot do anything for you. Subhanallah, that is the situation that will happen. On that day, everything would be by Allah's permission alone. Friends, in this world, Allah says, will be bitter enemies on that day. They will be running away from each other. Family members will be running away from each other. Why? Because some will be demanding good deeds from the others, and others will be running away from them because they do not want to give up their deeds. Some will be complaining to Allah about others, saying, Oh Allah, this is my father, this is my mother, this is my husband, this is my brother. They never taught me about you. They did not teach me about my religion. They did not teach me how to worship you and how to obey you. That will be a day where every single person will be looking for some excuse to give to Allah to bail himself out so that he will not be found guilty of anything. But that will not happen. People will make excuses, but Allah knows the reason. So in this world, you find that sometimes you speak to people. Nobody takes you on. 
you speak to people and you tell them the right thing and they are not taking you on. They are, not, they are just living their life, doing what they want, no matter how much you talk. But in the hereafter, that same person will complain to Allah that you did not tell them anything. But Allah knows the truth. But that is what the ahadith is, subhanAllah. The verse explains that the day of judgment will be such a dreadful day that family members and close relations will not be able to render assistance to each other. As I said, in this world, we are accustomed to getting help from each other. But on that day, that would not happen. Friends who also will not be able to help one another. Yes, you are friends in this world, you help each other. But that would not happen on the day, the day of judgment. All relations will be cut and each person will be concerned about himself. Allah speaks about this state of people on that day and states in another verse, then when the trumpet is blown, there will be no kinship among them that day, nor will they ask of one another. Subhanallah, in this world we are family. We have close family ties, we have close relatives, we have near, rel near relatives and far relatives. People, strong family ties, people who keep the bond together, they always look out for each other. And they always say, we are family. We look out for each other and we are family. What does Allah say? When the trumpet is blown, subhanallah, there will be no kinship among them on that day. No family ties again. Everybody will be in his own world. Everybody will be thinking about his own self or her own self. Nor will they ask of one another. It will be the world of nafsi. Every single person will be concerned about his own self to the extent that they will not even ask about another person. Nobody will ask, where is my father? Or where is my mother? Where is my son or daughter? Where is my spouse? Everybody will be thinking about his own self. Allah says, nor will they ask of one another. Another verse states, O mankind, fear your Lord and fear a day when no father can avail aught for his son. Yani, no father can help his son in any way. No a son avail aught for his father, nor can a son help his father in any way. Verily, the promise of Allah is true. Let not then this worldly present life deceive you, nor let the chief deceiver, Satan, deceive you about Allah. Subhanallah. Allah is telling us about what will happen on that day, my dear beloved brothers and sisters. This is something that would come and must come. This is what is ahead of us. We are living and we, every day that we live, we are walking closer to that life that Allah is mentioning here. We are getting closer to this day that Allah has mentioned here. Allah says on that day, there wouldn't be any family ties where people will be looking for each other. Everybody will be in the world of nafsi. Mind self, mind self, nobody will be asking about each other. A father will not be able to help a son. A son will not be able to help a father, Allah is saying. Allah is saying that the promise of that day is this true, it will come to pass. And then Allah gives us a very beautiful lesson. He says, when you know that day is coming, there are two things could hinder you from preparing and from your preparation to meet Allah on that day, two things. And these are known as deceivers. They deceive you. And Allah is telling us, let not these things deceive you. He says, this worldly life, the glitter and the glamour, the dazzling worldly life that shines to you like gold and silver, Allah says, beware, that's a deceiver. It deceives you. It makes you want to come towards it and you go into it and you get it and then it makes you so occupied in today that you forget about your purpose of life. You forget about the day when you will meet Allah. You forget about your, your worship to Allah. You forget about your deen and your Islam and your religion. You become so caught up. Your days go into it. Your nights go into it. Weeks pass, months pass, years pass. And you are so engulfed and engrossed in it. You forget about what you had to do as your service towards your Lord. You forget. And before you can actually take stock of yourself, the angel of death is standing before you, telling you, I have come for your soul, subhanAllah. That is what happens. That's one deceiver. The present life, the worldly life. And then Allah say, says, let not the chief deceiver, who is the chief deceiver? 
Satan. So Satan is behind you and he works through the worldly life, the glitter and the glamour to pull you into it and to catch you. And the monster and the purpose of both of these deceivers, they are one and the same, to hinder you from your, your duty towards Allah. That's the purpose and nothing else. As long as you are obedient to Allah and you hold on to the rope that Allah stretches from the heavens for you and you become obedient to Allah, then these things can't get the hold over you. But as long as you begin to actually slack off, as we say, then these things begin to deceive you and you actually move away from the path, the path of goodness. Subhanallah. As it is mentioned here, therefore, on that day of judgment, none shall be able to assist another against Allah's decree and decision. Nobody. None shall be able to assist another against Allah's decree and decision. Nobody. When Allah makes a decision, nobody can fight that. All relations shall be dissolved at that time, except that of the true believers and the righteous ones, subhanAllah. All relations shall be dissolved and cut off except the true believers. True believers who lived in this world and worshipped Allah together. True believers who are family members and all of them live their lives in goodness and righteousness. Yes, they will recognize each other. They will be in Jannah. They will be enjoying the pleasures. They will look out for each other, subhanAllah. They will know each other. They will greet each other. Friends also. Friends also who are righteous, who are pious, who are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will recognize each other. They will help each other. In fact, they will be able to intercede for each other with Allah's permission. And they will be together in Jannah. The true believers and the righteous ones not others besides them. With Allah's permission and mercy, they will be able to intercede for each other and also beseech Allah for one another. Surah Dukhan speaks about this in verse 42 and states, Except him on whom Allah has mercy, verily he is the Almighty, the most merciful. In other words, in the, in the ayah before verse 41, Allah said, The day... When a near relative cannot avail a near relative in aught, and no help can they receive, and then immediately after that he says, Except him on whom Allah has mercy. That a near relative cannot help a near relative, except if Allah has mercy on people, then he will allow them to do that. If they are believers and they are people who work righteous deeds, his mercy shall come to them. He will show compassion to them and be compassionate to them. And on account of that, he will allow them to help each other and to even intercede for each other. But that will be through his mercy. But without Allah's mercy on their own, they will not be able to help each other at all. Why Allah can do that? Because he's almighty and the most merciful, extremely merciful. It means that no one will be helped on the day of judgment except those to whom Allah bestows His mercy and compassion. Only those people will be able to help or even speak on behalf of or even intercede for another one. They shall be helped by Allah. In this way, it shows that nothing can help a person on that day except the mercy of Allah. For He is the mighty, the most merciful. And on account of His mercy, He will shower His mercy to the believers, those who lived in this world, went through difficulties and hardships, but did not ever give up his worship, subhanAllah. Allah will recognize that on the day of judgment, and he will bless them with a tremendous amount of blessings and goodness, subhanAllah. The verse also means that although friends and family members will not be able to help one another, the believers to whom Allah shall grant his mercy, will be able to intercede for one another and assist each other with Allah's permission. SubhanAllah. So therefore, that friends and family members would not be able to help each other on the Day of Judgment. But if Allah shows his compassion to them and showers his mercy over them, then on account of that, with his permission, they will be able to help one another. But again, that is with Allah's leave and Allah's permission. 
Surah Dukhan. It goes further in verse 43 to 46 and it states, after speaking about his mercy coming to the, the believers, he speaks now about those people who have done wrong things and committed sins on the face of the earth. He says, verily, the tree of Zakum, the tree of Zakum will be the food of the sinners in the fire of hell. In hell, there is a tree that will be growing in the middle of hell. The fruits of the tree will be called Zakum. And the people of hell will be ordered to eat that because they will be so hungry. They will be begging for something to eat. And then Zakum, the fruit of that tree in Jahannam in hell, will be given to them. When they eat it, it will be like boiling oil going inside their stomach. It will boil in their bellies. That is what will happen. It will begin to boil and it melt inside the bellies like the boiling of scalding water. That's how the water will scald a people, a person, so too, like it will boil in their bellies. That is what they will be given. And that is just one punishment of the fire of hell. In these verses, Allah mentions the punishment of the unbelievers in hell and states that they will be made to eat from the tree of Zakum. While explaining the verse, the commentators have stated, the tree of Zakum is a tree which Allah has created in hell and has named it the Shajara al Mal'una, the cursed tree. It is cursed by Allah. Whenever the inmates of hell will be hungry, they will rush towards the tree and eat from its fruits. When it reaches their bellies, that is the fruit, it will boil them just as hot water boils. <coughs> the tree of Zakum will be very bitter and its taste shall be horrible. The Holy Quran states in another ayah, it is a tree which grows from the depths of hell and its fruit resembles the heads of snakes. That is what the Quran says about the, 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 the fruit of the Zakum tree or the Azakum. Notwithstanding its horrible taste, the people of hell will be forced to eat it because of severe hunger which they will suffer after being fed with the Zakum fruit the inmates of hell will continue to suffer punishment in different ways. And then the Surah Dukhan continues with verse 47, speaking about the different <coughs> types of punishment that they will suffer. So we have come to the, uh, come to the end of today's class, and inshallah, we'll continue next week. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, and may He forgive us, have mercy on us, and grant us goodness in this life and the life hereafter. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.